Hi, everyone. Good Let's start with prayer. Steadfast God, in gratitude for all your blessings, we rededicate our lives to you. As we continue on our sacred journeys, kindle within in us a generous, generosity of spirit that we might learn to see your face in those around us. May your compassion guide us to work for peace, wholeness, and justice on their behalf. Amen. Amen. Our devotionals this week address God's commands regarding justice and the marginalized. What does marginalized mean? It means to regulate to an unimportant or powerless position. In Luke 4, Jesus revealed himself in fulfilling the prophecy of Elijah and Elisha and being the savior of the marginalized. The calling of the pastoral caregiver is to be the hands and feet of Jesus, especially for the marginalized. In Psalm 140, I know that the Lord secures justice for the poor and upholds the cause of the needy. Psalm 82, defend the weak and the fatherless, uphold the uh, cause of the poor and the oppressed, rescue the weak and the needy, deliver them from the hands of the wicked. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. <clears throat> Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers to his harvest field. In Leviticus 19, stand up in the presence of the aged, show respect for the elderly, and revere your God. I am your Lord. Do not use dis dishonest standards when measuring length, weight, or quantity. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Now today's lesson is from Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 24. When you make a loan of any kind to your neighbor, do not go into their house to get what is offered you as a pledge. Stay outside and let the neighbor to whom you are making the pledge bring the pledge out to you so that they may keep their dignity. If the neighbor is poor, do not go to sleep with their pledge in your possession. Return their cloak by sunset so your neighbor may sleep in it to keep them warm. Then they will thank you and it will be regarded as a righteous act in the sight of the Lord your God. Do not take advantage of a hired worker who is poor and needy, whether that worker is a fellow Israelite or a foreigner residing in one of your towns. Pay them the wages each day before sunset because they are poor and they are counting on it to keep their family fed. Otherwise, they may cry to the Lord against you and you will be guilty of sin. Do not deprive the foreigner or the fatherless of justice or take the cloak of the widow as a pledge. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. That is why I command you to do this. When you beat the olives from your trees, do not go over the branches a second, a second time. When you harvest the grapes in your vineyard, do not go over the vines again. When you are harvesting in your field and you overlook a sheep, do not go back to get it. Leave it for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow, so the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of their hands. 1 Samuel 16, But the Lord said to Samuel, The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance but the Lord looks at the heart. It never fails and always seems to happen in just the same way. There is an instance of racial outrage. 
a city erupts with protests, rallies, civil disobedience, and violence. Meetings are held, new procedures are put in place, and with the same result. Policing is scrutinized, procedures and practices are mildly reformed, and the matter is considered addressed. But the larger system is never really changed. This happens because we have continued to address the symptoms and never the real problem. We make subtle changes in a wholly broken system and expect that those changes will make a substantial difference. What is marginalization? It occurs when a person or group of people are less able to do things or to access basic services or opportunities. It's an involuntary condition, preventing them from access to resources, assets, services, preventing the development of capabilities and eventually causing extreme poverty. The poorest themselves have described their situation as being trapped in a complex knot, which can lead to further knots if the wrong threads are pulled. There are three main types of marginalization, social, economic, and political. People who are socially marginalized don't have the same social opportunities as others. They can't go to the same clubs, reasonably access the same shops or services, and they often live in segregated, socially excluded communities. This commonly affects ethnic minority <clears throat> groups and is often a lifelong marginalization that affects generations of the same family. Economic. Economic marginalization means people do not have the same chances as others to contribute to and benefit from the economy. They don't have the chance to get a good job. They can't attend a trade school or equip them with skills to enter a certain section, sector. They may struggle to make enough money to live a decent life or to access critical health care if they fall ill. Political marginalization means that some groups of people are not able to participate democratically in the decision-making process. If you don't have a seat at the table, it's very hard to get your voice heard. And when you already struggle to do it, it means politicians have a very easy time continuing to ignore your needs and focus all their attention on the needs of the majority. Okay, I'm going to ask who are the marginalized? Who, who are they? The uneducated. Yeah. Yeah. Who else? Obviously poor. Poor. Disenfranchised. The disenfranchised. Probably disabled. Disabled. Sometimes the elderly. Uh, definitely the other one. Mm -hmm. Any others? Okay. Immigrants and refugees, people of particular ethnicity or country of origin, that includes Blacks, Native Americans, Latinx, Middle Eastern, Asian, anyone who is not white. People of differing sexual orientation, people of differing religions, the poor and the homeless, the mentally ill, and as you said, the elderly, that's a, that's a big group, mentally and physically disabled, women and girls, somewhat in America, but definitely in other countries, children and youth, if they don't have strong family support, they are disenfranchised. Victims of human trafficking, <clears throat> people in prison, and, uh, and their families, very much so. And people with a different political orientation. 
How many of you are following the race task force? Show of hands. The PBS series Race, The Power of Illusion. I, I watched that this past week. I have not been following the, the race task force, but it was an extremely powerful presentation. This series enters, uh, centers around opportunity. Whiteness was the key to citizenship. The 1790 Congress passed an act declaring that only free white immigrants could become naturalized citizens. Our institutions and policies have assigned racial, racial identity, identities and reinforced racial inequality throughout this 20th century. After the Civil War, Blacks could become naturalized citizens, but only white citizens were able to vote sit on juries, get elected to public <clears throat> office, and had better jobs. To be white was to gain the full rewards of American citizenship. Courts determined a person's race. In Virginia, you were considered um, black if you had 116 African ancestry. In Florida, it was 1-8. In Alabama, if you had a single black ancestor, you were considered black. The narrative of European upper mobility, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, by working hard, but um, they had access to opportunities, which were excluded from farm workers and domestics, most of whom were non-white. Many unions locked out Blacks and Mexicans into low-paying jobs and kept them out altogether. Roosevelt's New Deal and Social Security offered many a path out of poverty. However, non-whites were excluded from most of these benefits. Following World War II, one million Black veterans were unable to buy homes in the new server, server, suburbs or to get loans <coughs> from the FHA, which racialized housing, wealth, and opportunities for decades. The FHA underwriters warned that the presence of even one or two non-white families in a suburb could undermine real estate values. An integrated network was a bad risk unstable both socially and economically. Between 1934 and 1962, the government under, underwrote $120 billion in home, home loans. Less than 2% went to non-whites. When non-white families moved into suburb, suburban neighborhoods, they saw property values decline precisely because they had moved into them. Very quickly, the integrated neighborhoods became predominantly non-white. Real estate agents practiced blockbusting by preying on the racial feel, fears of white homeowners to get them to sell quickly for less than the market value. And then they resold them to blacks at higher prices. Many whites left not for personal racism, but for economic fears that other whites might be first depressing their home value. So this created a vicious cycle. The tax base erodes, schools and services decline, and inequalities become geographic. Blacks were unable to generate wealth and provide opportunities for the next generation. This was important. The average black family has only one eighth the network of white families and this difference continues to grow. Even with the same income, white families have on average twice the wealth of black families. Much of the difference lies in the value of their homes. Dr. King said that people should be judged by the content of their character and not by the color of their skin. Whites assume that we're already there and that we live in a society where color does not matter. 
but the civil rights era did nothing to address the under, underlying economic and social inequalities that have long been in place. It is not recognized that current wealth is a starting point for the next generation. To discuss equity of opportunity, we need to recognize the inequality of the current condition. Who has had opportunities and who hasn't? And what can I do about it? So in Rowan County, there are a lot of nonprofits, most of which are trying to address some of these inequalities. So can you tell me some of the nonprofits that you know about or that you participate in? Any others? United Way. Yeah. Umbrella with quite a few It does. Yeah. There's some that for different sectors. Um, <clears throat> there are many, many others. Let me just run a list of a few of them. Who knows about the JLT Fieldhouse? Okay. JCL Fieldhouse. Hmm? It's JTL. JTL. Sorry about that. My dyslexia kicked in. <laughs> <laughs> so it involves um, coaching and mentoring through basketball and other sports. It is currently serving over 150 boys and girls a year communities and schools, Capstone Recovery Center, Prevent Child Abuse, Rowan, Families First, the Gateway Freedom Center, which helps women from prison, homelessness, violence, and drug addiction. Helps them to get residential and non-residential support. Rowan Vocational Opportunities, provide vocational assessment, work adjustment, training, and daily activity for physically, mentally, or emotionally handicapped adults. The ARC for the mentally disabled, Habitat for Humanity, Meals on Wheels, the Disabled American Veterans and Vets, Rupty Home Senior Center, which is near to near to my heart. It takes care of lots of uh, I mean provides socialization, a lot of programs for seniors, and a lot of outreach for seniors as well. The Rotary Clubs, the community care clinic. If you don't have insurance, that is really um, uh, a great safety net. Good Shepherds Clinic at First Baptist. Power Cross Ministries. I'll, I'll make a pitch for that one. Who, who knows Power Cross Ministries? Good. You need to. It's really good work. So they provide athletics and academic support. They provide a gang of Christian brothers for over 250 boys a year. Boy Scouts of America. Beacon Hall, who knows what Jody Black was doing there? I know you do. So they're providing music classes and concerts for disadvantaged children. We talked about Rowan Healthy Ministries and remember uh, Jobs for Life. Okay. They provided, uh, I was a teacher there for a while. Salvation Army. Family Crisis Council. And Kenny Harden is, um, uh, is a director of the High Road Incorporated. So they're advocating for undervalued and for unrepresented people. And he's working to help uh, military veterans. How can we best relate to and serve the marginalized? I have one more of that list. And that's, sure, that's sure. The great CDC. Uh, directly back at the issue you talked about with home ownership, they're trying to reverse the actual thing that happened in the 50s and 60s and going back to reinvesting 
in those marginalized communities, raising the home values and bringing private investment in, has been pretty successful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very good. And back to Rowan Health Ministries, they have transitional housing, permanent supportive housing, and they're getting ready to build 12 um, uh, supportive or transitional uh, houses uh, right behind their current uh, 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 their, their current center. And they are fighting also working with um, uh, drug rehab at drug rehab center. So that, that's going to be part of it as well. David, another one's the YMCA. And people have no idea the programs that are being run out of YMCA. There's so many different groups mm -hmm. that they just keep it pretty quiet. But a ton of folks donate tens of thousands of dollars to YMCA to try to go out to these programs, try to get kids off the street and do it pretty quietly. And they don't, they don't ever, you know, they, they don't ever raise the flag and watch. But there are hundreds of thousands of dollars programs being run out of there for definitely. Uh, they, they typically have about a million dollars a year they give away with membership. Yeah, I mean, it's and they keep it quiet and people don't know about it. I mean, I've, I've been on that board, I think Jay's on it now, but it's no, it's not now. But yeah, it's what they're doing is great because, and a lot of a lot, a lot of uh, donors are trying to find other things to do because a lot of these kids, like you said, have no parents, it's just awful. And anything we can do to instill in these kids the values and morals, I mean, it really helps. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Perfect, thanks. I mean, <laughs> any others? So, how can we best relate to and help the marginalized? We need to pay attention to what they say, avoid general, generalizations and stereotypes. Be willing to accept correction. When someone points out our errors, offer a sincere apology and be ready to learn from the experience. Be intolerant of intolerance. Be willing to confront hateful speech online, in person, and also from a friend or relative. Seek out marginalized voices and perspectives. Listen to them and learn. Um, last night on CBS, there was a um, presentation on the Holocaust, which was very powerful. And, and there were, they were talking to a group of high schoolers and doing and presenting to them. Our children don't know anything about it have no idea what took place. And there are Holocaust deniers who've got to speak up. We've got to keep it in, in front. You know, that program you're talking about, and, and with the uh, assault department, the high school kids, most of these kids were marginalized uh, uh, students themselves and were, they were. very unaware. Uh, and the, and the old lady that was you know, speaking to them, you know, brought tears to them. Right. It was uh, amazing. It was very moving that the, the actual survivors of the Holocaust came. Right. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And you're right. They were all of, um, of diff different races, ethnicities. They were all very well educated, but they were of uh, non white races. Educate your own community. Your voice is most effective within your own groups. God looks to us to be advocates and instruments of divine love whenever and wherever we can. We are called to work for justice and wholeness here on earth. Jesus told a parable centered on acts of compassion and justice, acts that include feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, welcoming the stranger, clothing the naked, caring for the sick, and visiting those in prison. Jesus' ties to these folks is so complete that he indicates any act of kindness or justice shown to the least of these is being shown to him as well. 
The church gives its best witness to Christ and to God's call for justice when it demonstrates compassion to the poor, powerless, and those who are unable to provide for themselves. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was a, a devout Christian. He preached and practiced the words of God, understood the term equality, and prayed for tolerance, unity, and acceptance of all people by all people. Dr. King was a visionary. We need for we the people of all colors, races, ethnic origins, and religions to spend a little time pondering on his words and then to practice some of what he preached. The words he left behind can be a wake up call that we have all been waiting for. Genesis 1.26, we are all one race, all created in the same image of the same God of one blood. We are one human race, testified by Paul in Galatians, to be one in Christ Jesus. It is time that we as a church lead in that proclamation. Amen. Okay. Hey, hey, David, I'd like to make um, the race task force, just for those of you who either have heard a little bit about it, nothing about it, or don't want to know anything about it. I, I will tell you, it is, they met up here three weeks in a row. Um, it's a very non-judgmental discussion. It's been incredibly healthy. Um, I'm going to say maybe a third of the people that came were from our church. They normally had 50 people at the meetings. Um, others were from all different parts of the community. Um, and it was really good. The biggest thing that I learned on the last one we had you're talking about Native Americans and, um, and and the Blacks in the community, but in 1928, there was a, the Congress voted in and just said, you couldn't be, and it may not have been a Congress, might have been a Supreme Court ruling, but you couldn't be a U.S. citizen if you were um, of Asian descent. I mean, the, the, I never knew that. And and I and I know I, I didn't go through World War II, but I understand the animosity on that. But I will tell you, I and it wasn't until 1962 that that got voted out. Um, but if you ever wondered why, I never knew the the problems with Asians getting attacked everywhere. Asians and Indians too. Yeah, I mean the from Native. India. Oh, from India. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, um. Kind of, yeah. I mean, it's never talked about it. Yeah, all these things. Yeah. So anyway, <clears throat> it's a very good message today. But I, I do want to share that. On the race task force. I plan to be involved, uh, after, especially after what I saw in all of the um, those TV programs. Oh, that that PBS broadcast like dumbs it down. If you don't get it there, like, <laughs> right. So uh, that's. Really enlightening, I thought. I did too. You know, Dave, this is a perfect lesson to follow the one we had last <clears> week <throat> about how the secular has got so separate from the sacred now that the churches have become more isolated. This is a way to reach out to society and kind of pull us back together again. That's a really good answer. That's well. Yeah, very well, very, yeah, very well suited with today's um, right. Very nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Good. 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 Good.